Today we're in the Gospel of John chapter 4, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Uh, last time, Miles Bennett, a wonderful man, my dad, began the narrative of what we call the woman at the well, going from verses 1 to verse 15. And for today, for context, we'll start in verse 13, and we'll read through verse 26, as we see the Samaritan woman's initial skepticism uh, turn into curiosity and then into belief in Jesus. So as we study this passage, uh, we'll see another example of the, the individualized evangelism from the best there is, Jesus. And, you know, I think it's just awesome that as Jesus is teaching us God's word and God's principles, he's also showing us the way to help teach others the same. So uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 13 through 26. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to everlasting life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you said, well, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship, I mean, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit, must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Powerful. Jesus and his disciples now are, are on a trip from uh, the northeast Judea, or Judah, uh, Judea, excuse me, heading towards Galilee, a, a trip that normally would take, um, they would normally take a week and a half, two weeks for that. It's the number of hours uh, time. But here we read about two more regions, two very real places in Israel. And you, you guys know by now the reason I bring this up is the, the uh, authenticity, the veracity of the Bible. These are ancient writings, but they are very real places uh, and so you can check out the Word of God. The region, uh, one region is called, the region is called Samaria, which Miles explained last week. And today there are still around 800 people or so that identify as the ancient Israel, as Israeli Samaritans and still follow their traditions and still use the same scriptures they used back then. Now the text that we're in today is in a town called Sychar. Uh, it's actually called now Askar in Israel. It was quite famous at the time and still is. You can still go there today and visit a 75 foot deep well that was dug by Jacob. And uh, it's a, a, a tiny town, it's a suburb of Nablus, which is a pretty modern city in Israel today. So it just kind of sets up where they're at. Now, Jesus had just used an earthly saying uh, as, as he was saying, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. And we see over and over, that Jesus uses earthly meanings, brings heavenly meanings into, his, into the conversation. So by the, the earthly water, he's talking about the natural water from the well. And by comparison or by parallel, the common and natural desires that our flesh has, that we're thirsty for, but they're never filled. I mean, the, you can drink the best water and guess what? You're gonna be thirsty a few hours later, if you're normal. <laughs> so we come back repeatedly to fill the desires we have in that thirst. And, and of course, Jesus brings a spiritual meaning with the enticement, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him 
will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, I don't think the woman there quite caught on to the, the meaning here that it was turning into a spiritual conversation uh, away from a natural conversation. And it kind of reminds me of the last chapter where Nicodemus was, was being told, you must be born again. And he's trying to figure out how to get back inside his mama <laughs> to see how that was going to work. Now, see, the, the woman didn't hesitate. She didn't try to figure all this out, figure out how the water was actually going to spring up from inside her and, and somehow make everybody who drinks it live forever. I, I think it just sounded a lot better than having to wait until the other women had cleared away from the well and then having to pull up you know, the, the buckets 75 foot deep and, and haul water back to her home every day. I think she was just thinking, I, that sounds like a good deal to me. Won't have to come here every day. But looking back, we, we know and knowing the scriptures ahead, we know that the living water that Jesus said would come in, from inside a person as a fountain of water springing up is the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? As much as we like coming to church, as much as we love inspirational meetings and, and love sitting under the teaching of God's word and fellowshipping, uh, we don't need to physically go somewhere else to find the power and the fulfillment that God gives us. It's <clears throat> it's simply through the filling of the Holy Spirit of God, something that's given freely to all believers who simply ask for it. That's where the, the living water comes from inside us as, as God gives us the Holy Spirit. Our life lesson here is, as we empty ourselves of our own selfish desires, God can fill us with living water, the Holy Spirit. As we empty ourselves of our own selfish desires, God can fill us with living water through the Holy Spirit. Now, as we will see shortly, God wants each of us to experience his love and forgiveness, and, and he wants to give each of us eternal life. However, there's so much more he has for us. It doesn't just stop there. There are more, many more joys. And, and I remember as, uh, as a teenager, soon after receiving Christ as my Savior, a youth group uh, asked, uh, that I was sitting under, asked the group, I'm going to tell you something, or told us, teased us with, I'm going to show you something better than going to heaven. And then when we got together in the group, he finally said, what's better than going to heaven? Now, I had no idea. I mean, I was pretty thrilled. I accepted the Lord and that, you know, I knew I would make it to heaven uh, following him. But after a few guesses from others in the group, he finally revealed the answer. Taking somebody with you. Better than going to heaven, taking somebody with you when you go. Obviously, you'll go. But now, we know we can't literally literally grab somebody. We'd like to, but we can't literally grab somebody that's bent on rebelling against God and knock them unconscious and put them on a bus and wake them up when the bus arrives at the pearly gates. So obviously, he meant sharing our faith in ways that helped others come to know Jesus as well. So in verse 14, we, we read that as God fills us with, our, with his Holy Spirit, it's not only our thirsts that are quenched, but we'll find that the living water flowing out like a fountain flowing out from us to others springs up into eternal life in their lives. It's not our eternal life that Jesus is talking about here. It's the, the eternal life begins when we accept the gift that Jesus gives us. As the Holy Spirit empowers us to tell others about him, to live for the Lord, to serve him daily in a way that others will see our good work to glorify our Father in heaven. All those things bring eternal life to those around us. So the Samaritan woman didn't understand all of this at that moment, but soon she would know more about it. It was a simple response, not knowing for sure everything he was talking about, but just having a, a little seed of faith. We hear about the mustard seed of faith that turned the tide because the idea that this man might actually have something, might actually be something greater than Jacob and provide something better than this faithful well that they, they've always drawn from her whole life. She took the chance and said, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Now at this point, Jesus could have gone ahead and explained the spiritual meanings that were buried in his word and, and uh, that we've talked about a little bit and unlock the mysteries and help her understand the forgiveness and the fulfillment that that living water would bring to her. But nevertheless, he, he had a better plan. 
And in verse 16, he, he looks like he takes a, a turn and says, go, call your husband and come here. Which sounds like a really odd thing to say to somebody when you're about to unlock the mysteries of salvation. Uh, but remember, Jesus spoke the words his father gave him. They didn't always seem to be exactly what you'd expect him to say. And actually, they're rarely what we would expect. But as the Spirit of God leads, we see the results are better than what we can imagine. Now, there have been times and situations where there have been words that came out of my mouth as I was sharing the gospel with somebody, and they were a little odd. Uh, okay, sometimes they were really odd. And, and as the words left my lips, I'm thinking, my brain is saying, what happened? And how in the world am I going to go out, reach, and pull those words back into my mouth? Because it just didn't sound right to me. Um, but they were loose. They were out there and it soon became clear that the Holy Spirit had given those words that needed to be spoken to help both me and the person that I was uh, sharing the gospel with or speaking with to find the connections that they needed in their hearts and their lives to, to result in the work that God was wanting to do in that person's life. So I, I will admit that I never actually have asked a woman, go call your husband and bring him back here. <laughs> But maybe, maybe this person, maybe she didn't expect that either here at, the, at Jacob's well. But she came right back. I have no husband. I don't know what inflection she did that with, but it was technically true. But she was also holding back information. You know, she hadn't raised her right hand and said, I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But Jesus did. Um, they both knew that she was not telling everything. Uh, she did have a man she was treating like a husband, but she didn't want to admit it. She didn't, she didn't admit to that. Moreover, she had also married five others before and uh, was no longer married to him. No wonder she was considered a bit of an outcast and, and maybe even, even in the mixed up Samaritan society, uh, she was still an outcast. There's something else in our 21st century Western minds that we're not really aware of here either. And that is that Jesus was preparing to teach some very important things. And in the ancient world, and especially in this society, learning, and especially religious learning, was the realm of men. Okay? Um, that's the society. That's the culture. And if they saw fit, and if their wife was very inquisitive, the, the man, the husband, might share that information with his wife. But a woman certainly would not be the one to receive the learning and then go out and share it with their husband or other men. That's unheard of. That doesn't, that's not supposed to happen. So even though Jesus knew she did not have a husband, he did the culturally correct thing at that time and asked her to call her husband, call for her husband. So in theory, he could learn the proper way and the wife would hear it at the same time or that he could explain it to her if she didn't understand. So... Anyway, just want to want to give that little bit of background. So it's not as odd as we think it might have been, but it just it's different. Um, but no matter how Jesus responded, he would be re able, he would be able to, to reveal his identity uh, to her previous and, and answer her previous question that was, "Are you greater than Jacob?" Okay, remember she asked that uh, in last time's teachings. So yes, she was full of questions. Um, Jesus didn't let the questions that weren't relevant distract him and it was time to let her see who he really was. Now that's a good lesson to us. Sometimes people will ask us questions and they're not really germane to the conversation that we're having with them. And so sometimes we just have to go right past the questions. We don't have to answer everybody's questions or concerns. Sometimes they're just there to throw us off to keep us from sharing God's word with them. And sometimes they're honest concerns. And so you have to let the Holy Spirit lead you in your witness and in your sharing so that uh, these, the real question can be gotten to. So in verse 17, Jesus said to her, you have said, well, I have no husband for you had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. So I, I think her response is a little funny. She had been a bit disrespectful at first to this stranger asking for, for water and then, 
and, and then acted oddly, maybe a bit, bit snooty. Is that a good word? <laughs> As he talked about this gift from God for her. And now she was hiding the fact that she'd been married at least five times and now living with somebody else. But suddenly Jesus responds to her, let him knew. He knew all about it. And I can see, I can hear her, but she was just a little embarrassed at that point, but, but finally kind of made the understatement, uh, sir, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. I mean, what else can you say? <laughs> but she's, you know, she's saying this, and, and what's left unsaid here by Jesus is also noteworthy. You see, Jesus did not call her out for her adulterous lifestyle. Now, before you make them, before you think I'm making a false assumption, uh, understand it's pretty much against all odds that a woman would have had five husbands who all either abused on her, cheated on her, failed to support her, uh, you know, or died on her. And after that, that she would take up with another man that she wasn't married to and not be adulterous. Okay. And we know she wasn't a widow because certainly with that standing in the community, she would be wearing certain clothes that would indicate she was a widow. So, you know, Jesus was there, but, but Jesus was there to meet her needs. He wasn't there to condemn her sinful acts like so many others uh, in her community and also Jewish people. I mean, as we know, Jewish people would not even walk through that community. They'd go, they'd travel another, another day to get to where they were going to avoid going through this region. Okay, that's, that's how con con condemning they were. No. We remember in the last chapter in John 3, 17, Jesus said very clearly, for God did not send his son into the world to what? To condemn the world, but what? That the world through him might be saved, okay? So now his words were not of condemnation, but actually he twice praised her. You know, he said, you have said well, I have no husband, and in that you, tr you spoke truly, you know, a little bit tongue-in-cheek maybe you know Jesus was a, I think he would, was a very nice man to be around <laughs> as an earthly man um, and, and even more so now uh, but of course he knew there was sin and she didn't deny she knew she was sinning she didn't deny Jesus statements and you know I think it's this immense kindness that, that Jesus showed to her at this time that that brought her around from being or to being more receptive and more respectful in this moment. And you remember it, we remember again, we keep going back to it, but it keeps coming to us. At the beginning of John, we're told, in, told for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. The truth had to be known, but grace came first. So our life lesson here is in our conversations with others who we know to be sinful, always share God's grace before sharing the hard truths. In our conversations with others who we know to be sinful, always share God's grace before sharing the hard truths. That opens up the people's hearts as we see that Jesus has done several times. Now earlier in the conversation, we talked about ignoring. Jesus had ignored the remark about how the Samaritans were looked upon, down upon by the Jews. Instead, he piqued her interest by turning the issue on its head and told her if she knew the gift God wanted to give her, that she'd be asking him for it. That's a great example of sharing our faith. We help people see what their true needs are. We help them seek and help them find the answers. Now, like I've alluded to, when she, made, when she made the remark earlier, it seemed a little contentious and he just ignored it. You know, somebody's... Uh, being contentious to us, we can, it's okay to ignore them. You don't have to fight with them. You know, our first human reaction, carnal reaction is, you said something bad about me. You said something bad about my faith. You said something bad about my God, my Jesus. I'm gonna, you know, I wanna fight. But he just ignored it. But the conversation turns and the next thing the woman says immediately uh, after saying, I, I see, you must be a prophet. She, she says in verse 20, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Now, if she had said this earlier, I would have thought that she was still being contentious. That's because the mountain, Mount Gerizim, was considered by the Samaritans to be the only place to worship God. 
Mount Moriah in Jerusalem was considered by the Jews to be the only place to worship God. And many think that the Samaritans, they, the, the Samaritans had a different Torah. They had a lot of differences in their Torah and the Jewish Torah. And many think they changed that to make it look like God wanted them to worship on Mount Gerizim because they were too lazy to make the trips to Jerusalem every year they were supposed to make. So they built their own temple there. So to make matters even worse, the temple that was there was destroyed. Best information we have is by Jewish priests about 150 so years earlier before this conversation took place. And, and even during the time of Jesus, the Jews had a special holiday around this time of year, about four days before Hanukkah, that celebrated the destruction of the temple on Mount Gerizim. So there's a lot of bad blood <laughs> between that. And the Samaritans continue to, I mean, to this day, they continue to consider that mount to be the place to worship. But given that background and conflict, what we're seeing now, I think, is a change of heart and an honest concern. The woman now knows that she's talking with a man of God, a prophet. This is something that's been on her heart for a long time. I think she's thought about this, how to truly worship God. Yes, she was living sinful, but, you know, sinful people wanting to know God too. <laughs> okay? Um, she wanted to know. I think, she, you know, I, I can just imagine that she'd probably been seeking, earnestly seeking God earlier in her life, trying to do what's right, looking for that fulfillment and satisfaction that she looked later on, looked for in many men. Um, but, you know... This, this, this following God thing would be great in fellowshipping with others if it weren't for all the people, right? <laughs> the, the people around her, the Samaritans, and then the Jews were so busy about how to argue, I mean, arguing about how to worship God and, and where and, and what to do, they many times didn't actually truly worship God. Uh, maybe she tried to fill that God-shaped hole in her heart with the other desires, with the men and other pleasures that... And, and just follow wherever those things took her. And we see that she was not, that, that she was thirsty for things, but she was not being fulfilled. Jesus knew that she needed to be fulfilled. And now she finally finds a true man of God that can solve the mystery for her and tell her the true way to worship God, the true way to have peace with God. So our life lesson is that you don't win people to the Lord by dwelling on divisive issues. Focus on how Jesus fulfills the needs that we all have. You don't win people to the Lord by, by dwelling on divisive issues. Focus on how Jesus fulfills the needs that we all had. You know, Jesus could have told her flat out, you people don't know what you're talking about. You don't know who you're worshiping. You're wrong. The Jews are right. You've got to change everything you do. But here again, we go with grace first, then truth grace and truth. Verses 21 to 24, I'm going to read that in the Amplified this time because it brings a few nuances of meaning out. It says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither merely in this mountain or merely in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not know what you are worshiping. You worship what you do not comprehend. We do know what we are worshiping. We worship what we have knowledge and understand. For after all, salvation comes from among the Jews. A time will come, however, indeed, it's already here when true, genuine worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in reality. For the Father is seeking such people as these, as his worshipers. God is a spirit, a spiritual being, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, in reality. So this issue, this problem, is eliminated. <laughs> They've been fighting for years, dead centuries. The problem is eliminated. Worship of the Father is not dependent on geography, but on the state of the heart. Worship is done truly, done spiritually and truthfully. I really love that Jesus tells her and, and us that the Father is seeking just such people as his worshipers. You know, what an incredible statement. What, what good news. When you're sharing good news with others, do you ever hear somebody say in some way, 
I was hurt by somebody in the church and I'm not going back. No, no, you never heard that. Yeah, I'm sure you have. Maybe, maybe such and such a church. Oh, they're full of phonies. I don't want to be a part of that. Well, I'll tell you what, it's probably worth your while to jot down and memorize John 4, 23 to 24. It's two verses just to be ready for these responses. And I think it's a perfect opportunity. I mean, I, I can just, you know, I, and I want to I want to try to be, be ready for this when the Lord gives an opportunity, uh, when they were hurt, and just say, you know, I understand how you feel that way. Jesus came across a woman in the Bible just like that, and he said, God is looking for people just like you to worship him. And I can see their face, what? <laughs> I mean, they were they were driven away from the church. But no, God is looking for people just like you to worship him. And the scripture says, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And continue sharing, you know, that, that you know, God is heartbroken by deceitful people especially religious leaders that say one thing and do the opposite. And by, by those that don't even know him, don't even know God, but are claiming to teach others in his ways. I'm not saying that every church is bad, but we have to start worshiping him, him in spirit. Let our own sinful demands and desires fall away and totally follow him in truth. And, you know, I think that can help you, you know, at end of introduction to conversation with a with somebody that's that's been hurting and i think god can use those words of scriptures to help turn someone's heart knowing that god really desires them he doesn't like this he doesn't like the hypocrisy any more than they do he doesn't like the two-facedness that they may have seen they don't like the, the hurting he doesn't like any of that he wants you to continue to worship him so Again, we're seeing here how Jesus is telling us how to minister, setting the example of how we can communicate the things of God to people here on earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. I know it took a long time in that, but I, I think it's very, uh, very helpful to look at Jesus' example for us. And, and our life lesson here is, as followers of Jesus, follow his example and do the work he has called you to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. As a follower of Jesus, follow his example and do the work he has called you to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's dig in just a little bit to see what that actually worshiping in spirit and truth looks like. In spirit, Philippians 3.3 3 in the Amplified says, For we who are born again and have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, set apart for his purpose, and are the true circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and glory and take pride and exult in Christ Jesus and place no confidence in what we have or who we are in the flesh. Okay, brothers and sisters, we must depend on God's spirit for strength and assistance, intentionally putting our entire being under his influence and operations. We must devote our whole selves to the service of God. We also see the apostle Paul's example in, in Romans 1, 9, where he says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my whole spirit, rendering priestly and spiritual service in preaching the gospel and telling the good news of his son. And we must focus on worshiping him, worshiping him with all that is within us. Uh, there's nothing new here. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, we hear Jesus repeats, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And with all your strength, you know, that, that's been hundreds, maybe thousands of years that's already been in effect by the time Jesus tells people this. Now, walking in the spirit many times is the opposite of walking in the flesh, the old corrupt nature. And, you know, just to give you pictures of it, you know, God's provided in Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 to 18, uh, a picture of that walking in the spirit. But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsive to and controlled by and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the, the cravings and desires of the flesh, of human nature without God. 
for the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, the godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other, continually withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free, but you are prevented from doing what you desire to do. But if you are guided, led by the Holy Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, to see more of this, I'm not going to dwell on this long, much longer here, but I want to encourage you to study out Galatians 5, how life in the Spirit compares to life in the flesh and, and how our freedom from the law works out in real life. And it's all right there, especially uh, verses 22 and 23. Uh, that tells us the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within accomplishes. Love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint. Against such things, there is no law that can bring a charge against us. So, you know, that's the kind of life I think everybody likes to be around people that have these fruit, this fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So it's really good stuff. Um, worship God in spirit and in truth. As we worship him in truth, that is sincerity, God not only desires our innermost being to worship him, but also to be true. David declares in his prayer to God in Psalm 51, 6, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. We must aim at God's glory, not for show, but for, but, but draw near to him with a true heart for that fellowship that we need to have with him. I often repeat the, sir, uh, excuse me, I often uh, open this service here uh, before uh, the teaching with reading from Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, concerning the importance of that fellowship together. Leading up to that passage in verses 22 and 23, we read a really good explanation in the Amplified Bible coming up to that. It says, let us all come forward and draw near with true, honest and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith that the leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty or evil conscience and our bodies cleansed with pure water. So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it for he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that, that's a lot. <laughs> but it's uh, but just bearing, bearing your heart, bearing your soul, being truthful, open with God. Don't put on pretenses. That's not what worship of God is about. I would love to get into a deeper study of worship, uh, digging into so many ways that we can worship God in spirit and truth. Maybe we can have a, a midweek sometime and, and hit on some of those things. Uh, but there is another homework assignment for you, and that is uh, do a search for the word worship and read the scriptures that you find in their context, not just the one word, but also those before and after. Meditate on these meanings and, and incorporate these things into your daily life. Our life lesson for us today here is worship God in spirit and in truth. Worship God in spirit and in truth. So, well... Um, time's getting short, so let's get back to finish up today's text. For we know that in the Gospel, John does not always record the full conversations. He can't put all of it in there. But I can imagine as Jesus taught this woman how to worship the Lord in spirit and truth, that many of the scriptures that she had seen in the Torah and in the Psalms had been brought up. And that's why I encourage you to study these out for yourself. No doubt he mentioned scriptures that this woman had heard throughout her whole life. But as Jesus put the pieces together, it unlocked a childlike faith in her heart that she had not known for many years. Maybe your study of these scriptures will work the same in you, will unlock some of your childlike faith once again. And you know, at some point she looked in the eyes of Jesus and, and cautious, but hopefully said, or yeah, hopefully said what we read in verse 25, it says, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things. And in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. You know, for all of the, 
the warping of theology and mixings of religions that took place in Samaria, one of the more powerful beliefs was not lost. And that was the belief that the Messiah would come and he would tell them all things. Don't you love it when you see the word of God come alive in somebody's life like this? Uh, when you see the tiniest spark of hope start to appear and, and just maybe an ember that's been smoldering underneath for decades is, starts to, to catch on fire and burst into flame and a person's heart's on fire, they finally see the light. It was no accident that Jesus stopped by this well at this time of day in Samaria and started a conversation with this woman. God had chosen her even before the foundation of the world to be a key to evangelizing the entire region, just like he's chosen you and me to evangelize our areas. He chose us before the foundation of the world. And, and this is a region that was a, a difficult one, one that had strayed far from true worship of God for literally centuries. But now, this woman's, the, the people rejected. Her eyes were wide open. Her heart was receptive. And 1 Corinthians 13, 12 gives us a scene of the last few moments. I think when it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm known. Suddenly, the woman at the well realized the dim reflection she'd seen so many years ago for so many years were opening up. They were clearing up. Not only were her secret actions known, but now she would never, uh, she would never know only just a tiny part of God's plan for her, but she was now face to face with the Holy One she had longed to see. Probably thought she'd never in a million years ever see the Messiah, and here he was. And remember, not even the self-righteous Jews that dared walk through Samaria, but now the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords himself was standing there answering her questions and humbly saying, I am he. I, 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 I who speak to you am he in the scriptures. Not, oh, bow down, I'm the king. <laughs> no, it's like, that's me. You're talking about me. So next week, we're going to see what happens, what this woman does with her newfound knowledge. Uh, we're also going to see something interesting, how the disciples could have really messed up at this point because as he was telling her this, as he was revealing himself as the Messiah, and she is probably standing there with her mouth open, wow, these guys come up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, guys, you, know, you can't get, get more than three or four guys together, and they're making racket, they're rattling things, they're making noises, and all of a sudden they're seeing Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman of probably poor reputation and all of a sudden it gets silent. Let's see what happens next week as you come back and uh, we find out more about that. Today, I hope you put your trust in Jesus. I hope that every day you ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit to give you the power to do the work that he has, the work he wants to do through you every day. And at this time, I want to pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so very much for being here and thank you all for watching on, on the screen.